Hello everyone, welcome to this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. I'm your host Scott and no down with me this week, but that doesn't mean we're going to end 2020 without a bang. We have got for you an amazing guest for our last show of the year and we are welcoming on Marco Koch who is former world champion and world record holder in the 200 meters breaststroke. And he is going to talk through with us his experience at ISL, his preview looking forward to the Olympics, and then breaking down breaststroke stroke and technique for all of you listeners at home. So welcome to the show, Marco. How are you doing today? Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm doing really good. Great stuff. Um, How is life in Germany right now? Let's start with that. Because in the UK here, it's pools are still, they're shut, they're reopening. It's a lot of clubs and swimmers aren't in the water. So what's it like over there? Are you in full lockdown? Is it a bit more of a soft lockdown over there? Yeah, we have what we call a lockdown light. Okay. So all the restaurants and stuff is closed. Gym and pools are closed for the public. But right. I'm really fortunate to be able to train still. But not all of the club swimmers are able to. Just a yeah, small amount. Just, of just the elite athletes. Yeah. Okay. So when you came back from ISL, was there any transition period in you coming back into the country? Did you have to lock down for two weeks or were you able to go straight back into training? Um, no. Uh, we had to take, take a corona test before coming back to the country. Right, okay. And then I had like a one-week break where I didn't train, but it wasn't because of any quarantine or something. It was just I had a lot of problem with my groins during the ISL. Oh, right, so okay. I just took a few days off, and after five days, I took a second corona test just to make sure that I'm fine before yeah. i go back into training okay so was that injury a result of racing for six weeks straight was it too intense almost yeah i think it was mainly because i didn't have any competitions for such a long period and yeah then, like five races in really short amount of time and mm-hmm. also with the hundred and the skin races coming all together it was maybe just a little bit too much for my old body <laughs> there's a there's a very um stacked program at iso i mean the two hours just for one meet is um is tight there's not much turnaround to recover is there yeah you really need to get used to it when i first started at the isl last year it was just amazing it was so fast it's, yeah yeah so uh, much fun yeah so you're part of the new york breakers we spoke to a lot of the young english and british talent over there during isl what was it like to be part of such a young team going forward was it exciting did they do you proud yeah, I think we did really, really well. We, yeah, all of us did really good times, and I think we can really be proud of ourselves. We made it to the semifinals, and yeah, the four teams going to the final, they were just on another level. But I think it's okay for this year. We did really, really good. Yeah, I think the um, the difference between the breakers and the other team was just squad depth. I don't think you were lacking the the first places, the winnings. It was more the depth when it came to the relays and other events like that that really was the only sort of downside to the breakers because actually there were some really big standout performances from yourself as well. Yeah, and also I think our, our matchup was quite a tough one. So yes, definitely. Yeah. Maybe it would have been, yeah. Yeah, you, d- you did have quite yeah. a tough... <laughs> I don't think there was an easy schedule there for you. Was there really? yeah. um, so as one of the older members of the New York Breakers, did you take any time to do any coaching, pass on any wisdom to the younger members? Because I know there was it was quite a strong breaststroke core as part of your team, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah, I did a lot of breaststroke work, especially on the pullouts with a lot of people. Yeah. And I think they really enjoyed it. And yeah, it was... For me, it's always fun to try to help with stuff like this because I think I I watched so many videos of swimming technique and breaststroke Mm. technique, especially that I got a really good feeling for how to improve, like with small, yeah, really small pieces. And it worked out pretty well. So So you like the analytical side of it a bit more? Yeah, I I really enjoy it. Do you think it's um, opened your eyes up to kind of coaching in the future? Is that something that you're looking at doing? I'm not 100% sure because like spending 20 hours a week at the pool now, 
Yeah. I'm not sure if I want to stick to that for the rest of my life, but okay. we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> might after two or three years break at the end of your career, it might it might come back to you, the drive to get near the pool again. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what was your favorite part of ISL? Because at home, we love the excitement of it, how fast it was. As a swimmer in the environment, is there anything that particularly stood out for you? Yeah, I, I just love the r- really fast pace racing that it's not like, you spend your whole day at the pool, it's just two hours and yeah. that's it. And you, you race over and over again. And especially after such a long time without any competitions, it was just so much fun to get back into it. Yeah. Because I, I don't really enjoy training without a goal in mind, you know? Yeah. Because I understand every that. competition got like postponed or cancelled. So for me, it was pretty tough, especially in the summer, to just focus on training because I didn't know what the next meet would be like of course the main goal will be the olympics but still you need some like short-term goals to work towards yeah so it was really really nice to have those yeah definitely i mean i think you went into the meet on top form so there was obviously a lot of motivation in your training beforehand um so you only just missed the 200 meter world record is it a goal of yours to go again for it next year is there any short course meets you're looking at to see if you can break that two minute barrier at all yeah i think i won't have a chance before the olympics okay but hopefully afterwards so i'm not thinking about retiring after the olympics good yeah so yeah i think it should be able i should be able to go in the like range of sub two hopefully i think this year just with my grind problems and not be able to some a lot of breaststroke in between the meets mm. which yeah i mean you would you wouldn't know you had an injury looking at the races if i'm honest yeah but at our f- last meet from the like prelims yeah i had to sc- scratch the whole second day and also the relay on the first day because in the 200 on the last 25 i just like teared my groin okay so it was a bit yeah hard decision for me to take off on the second day but i think it was a right one yeah yeah kept you fresh for the uh semi-final in the end yeah so does isl therefore factor into your your training cycles in the future is it after the olympics is it something that you're really looking at targeting your training towards or is it an afterthought no, I think it will be part of our program because I love the, the, the racing. Yeah. In 2016, after the Olympics, I did all of the World Cups. And at the end, I broke the world record at the German National Championship. Yeah, so yeah. I really like to race a lot. So I think it will be something that we will implement in our normal routine. Nice. Um, something me and Dan were talking about before is we're wondering how it actually prolongs swimming careers because most people after the Olympics, they stop because you've then got to target another four years until the next Olympics. Does it give you kind of a, a short-term goal or something a bit closer to the horizon that helps you keep going? I don't know if it's like this for me because I, I keep swimming because I really just still enjoy it and I really okay. love it. And I, I will keep on swimming until I feel like it's time to end it. Yeah. And even ISL won't make a difference for me. I think. Right. Okay. Like right now, it really just gives us another opportunity to race during the year. Hopefully, it will change swimming that it's not just you watch swimming at the World Championships in summer and maybe at like European or World Championships short course in winter. So mm. you can just watch swimming whole year. You know. Yeah. It it this gives would be really good. Well, it does. Re- it really does give some really good exposure to swimming. I know over here in the UK, there's there's not really been much sport on TV and it's kind of the excitement for swimming has kind of exploded again. It's almost a, a shame there's such a gap now until we have British trials in April. It's it's like yeah. you're itching to watch more swimming. <laughs> um, yeah. So the ISL, it was it was different this year because of the bubble. Now we have we've listened to Paul Boy's podcast and they talk to London Raw's general manager. And the talk next year is that there isn't going to be a specific bubble, but there are going to be kind of two camps. So is is that something you're looking forward to? Kind of like the first four rounds in one location is the bubble. It is not quite a bubble next year, but is that something that is an advantage to you being able to stay in one location? 
I think this year was kind of tough for me to be in one location for like five weeks. Okay. I think it was almost a little bit too much for me. The first like two, three weeks were okay. But after that, it, I just wanted to go home. You know, I just missed my home and my normal surroundings. So yeah. I think for me, it would be better to kind of split it up okay. and have it like at two or three locations. Because mm. like competitions like the Mar Nostrum tour every year, I really enjoy it too. Yeah. So you enjoy the traveling tours. about and seeing new yeah. places. Yeah, true. Keep it keeping things fresh. I mean, I think the thoughts are there's going to be like four rounds in Europe while four rounds in America's taking place and then they join up again for the semi final and finals. I think that's what they're looking at doing. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> yeah. The Olympics is obviously a massive target at the end of this season and with Tokyo being pushed a year back, did it mean you had to readjust your training cycle much or is it kind of you know your last six months going up to the Olympics. Let's just redo I think for, redo that. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me it was a good thing to have one more year of preparation. Okay. Because last year at around Christmas I changed coaches one more time. Yeah. I went back to my old coach, Dirk Langer. I worked with him from 2010 to 2012 and okay. afterwards just for a few training camps. So we always stayed in contact, but now I'm working again with him full time. Yeah. And this would have given us just like eight months to prepare. So mm, it would quite be short, like, yeah. don't, don't make any mistakes in these eight months. So now we got one more year. And I think the ISL competitions showed that we were on the right track. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Because it was my fastest time since 2016. And I was so consistent also with my times and my mm. form. So I'm really happy with that. And yeah, now I think we just know what to do. Yeah, it's a nice blessing for you then. Yeah. So what's your um, goals going into Tokyo? Because to me, the 200 breaststroke looks quite wide open, as in who can who can medal there? Is it is it on your horizon to... I don't know. You, of you, course. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. It's kind of, of a silly would, question. Would, <laughs> yeah, of course, it would be a dream to come home with the medal. But I think for me, I just want to make a race where yep. I hit the wall and then I'm like totally fine with whatever I achieved that I'm just happy with my race, that I did anything and everything in my capability, and then I will be hopefully pleased with the race. <laughs> so, so you're focusing on, on your own achievements again. If you hit new PBs like you did in ISL, that's kind of all you're, all you're looking for. Yeah, hopefully just the perfect race, and then we, we see what we get for it. Nice, nice. Um, so the breaststroke technique, it's not one I'm overly specialized in. But when you watch swimmers, there seems to be a difference between the breaststroke racers at 200 distance, the breaststroke racers at 100 distance, and then the 50. So how much effort goes into training these different techniques in racing? Is it you're adapting your one stroke or do you have a different stroke for your 200 races, a different stroke for your 50s? Yeah, at the ISL event, I was playing a lot with my strokes, especially in yeah. the 50 and 100. But I mostly focus on my 200 meter technique, and then I just try to like get up my frequency and everything, mm. because I don't want to focus on the 50 technique because I, it's nothing I really need for the 200. No, so I don't want to yeah. like put too much effort in working for the 50 and 100. I just need like a, my easy speed in the first 100 for the 200. So it's just a tool for me. Mm. So. We got like one easy speed session per week where we work on stuff like this. Okay. But that's about it. Yeah. Not too much. Because How? yeah, 200 is my main focus and I don't want to play around with too many strokes, you know? Yeah. How much difference is there between a 200 race and a hundred race in breaststroke? Because for most other races, you always see them, you always see swimmers double up, but breaststroke is one of the few where it's quite rare to see nowadays. Yeah. Right now, I don't get how to swim a fast hundred, so I <laughs> think I'm I'm the wrong person to ask because for me, it's in the hundred in the first hundred of my two hundred meter race mm. at the ISL, I went like four and five strokes, super easy. Yeah, and then I basically do six, seven, eight strokes, and I don't get any faster. So okay, I really need to figure it out somehow <laughs> how to go fast in the hundred and the fifty. I mean, but if the hundred's not really a goal, it doesn't matter, does it? You just stick to that two hundred pace that's clearly yeah. clearly doing you well. Yeah, true. <laughs> um so 
how much time training wise goes into technique base because it is it is a technical stroke how much time do you put yeah. aside to literally just work on technique look at video back how much time goes into developing your stroke i think not too much in the like just technical drill stuff i maybe okay. got like one or two sessions where we do technical drills at the end yeah i like to do it in like my main sets and training okay. under race speed conditions so, so when, when your body's under stress. 50, yeah, when I do my 50s in race pace and I hit a certain time and then I try to change small things yeah. just to see what the impact is. Just maybe a little less power, a little higher frequency or bringing down the strokes or go with a wider pull in the arms, smaller kick in the leg, stuff like this. Mm. And then I just try to feel what's the fastest for the current situation okay. because also this is changing for me always over the season. Yes. At the end of the ISL, I could swim with a wi much wider stroke in my arms because mm. I was r way more rested. And yeah, it really paid off for me. Yeah. So your your stroke kind of, it changes as you get, fa not fatigued, but as you go through a long meet like I ISL, you have to adapt it slightly. Yeah. And so in between matches, normally I do always like many 50s okay. in race pace with a lot, of, a lot of rest in between. So I don't get too tired, but just get a feeling for my stroke. But okay. this year it was just a little bit problematic because of my groin. Yeah. Because yeah. That was one problem for me. <laughs> is that is that a training method that you've learned over the course of your career or is it something that's become a staple from day one? I don't think from day one, but I, I started like I don't know, maybe like ten years ago. Okay. Twelve years ago. I always did like these kind of fifties just to get a feeling for my stroke for what's the best for the day i'm always playing around with my stroke so yeah is, is it a, obviously you then have a very adaptable stroke depending on how you're feeling through the water yeah yeah i think from the outside maybe you can like see big changes but for me sometimes it feels like a completely different stroke even though you just okay. change like a really small part yeah. of the stroke you have a completely different catch in the water or yeah 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 okay. it just feels like a different stroke <laughs> is um have you had to develop your stroke at all over the course of your career to keep up with kind of there's been some weird adaptations i know you said the hundred is one you can't figure out but to me the hundred breaststroke is swam very differently nowadays than it was 10 years ago have you changed over the course of your career to keep up with these times or are you sticking to basically what you're comfortable with no i think i also changed my, my okay. technique quite a lot over the last years i used to swim with a really really powerful stroke and very little like stroke count per lane yeah and i kind of changed it to not as much stop and go okay. after every stroke but with like less power yeah because i'm way stronger now so i don't need to put as much power in each stroke and it feels really easy now okay. to just maintain the speed for the 200 yeah yeah i mean that's uh what the best 200 breaststrokers in the world they've they always it just looks so comfortable when they're swimming a 200 yeah it's almost lazy like looking <laughs> yeah but it doesn't feel lazy no no i have i have I no doubt <laughs> that's not what i'm saying you're almost crying <laughs> putting yourself through all sorts of pain while we sit there and just like wow that looks so comfortable <laughs> yeah um so a big talking point of isl i'm not sure if you have any views on it is mel marshall pointing out um that there were a few i'm not going to name names because we don't do that there was a few breaststrokers during the especially the 50 races their breaststroke kick their knees weren't getting very wide at all they were very narrow to the point where it started to look like butterfly leg kick with just separated knees now how much advantage is that actually going to give a swimmer in the water as a breaststroke expert i i think it really depends on the swimmer okay there's a lot of swimmers like myself my butterfly underwater kick is really really fast mm. so i think i would take a big advantage from it but other breaststrokers who are mainly breaststrokers and not so good in the other strokes they maybe won't profit okay. at all or maybe even get slower but i would just say just use the underwater cameras we have them Why yeah just use them you know just use them and every talking will be gone is it something so we don't that... need to 
Yeah. Is it something that maybe could be done almost like a video referee looking underwater? Is that something that you'd maybe advise just to cut out this controversy? Yeah, it would make things so much easier. Mm. And then, yeah, you could just put... I think we also have it, like right now, one camera on almost each lane. So you could also see if someone's doing illegal kicks after the dive or whatever, so... Yeah, I guess the issue is how quickly it needs to get spotted because between swimming race and swimming result, there's not traditionally much time at all, is there? So you need the referee to be hot on it and then disqualify them if they are doing a legal butterfly leg kick kind of immediately. Also in the the relay, sometimes it takes some time to see if someone made a false start or anything. So I think we just need this kind of minute or... How long it's gonna take maybe you need more than one referee for it but i mm. think it would be possible just use the technology that's available to us yeah true and then there wouldn't be any talking because then you got the facts yeah yeah i mean in some ways the talking is i hate to say it the controversy is quite good for swimming because it it boosts that exposure it brings a lot of talking points to the race it adds that rivalry because I think that was what was added to Adam Peaty, why he, I think why he hit that 100 world record was because he was motivated by these Mel Marshall comments. So maybe it is slightly good for swimming, but again, controversy isn't something we overly want in the sport. So maybe you're right. Maybe we do need to make use of all of these cameras in the pool. They're not just there for show. Let's actually use them for something. Yeah. I mean, they put the, the dolphin kick in and the breaststroke in the first place because everyone was doing one after the start yeah and maybe even after the turn so mm. I, I think it would be a bad thing to just allow dolphin kicks in the breaststroke because yeah. it would just take what's special in breaststroke and i think that wouldn't be a good thing yes yeah, a very so i think just use the cameras yes yeah, a very unique stroke isn't it it's um yeah it's very old school stroke if i'm honest <laughs> yeah <laughs> One of our coaches always said the breaststrokers are like the kind of artists from swimming. Definitely, you know? yeah. It's um, <laughs> like really special. <laughs> I mean, when I was swimming, I could never overly master it because um, my feet turn inwards, so I could never get my ankles out far enough to get the stroke overly correct. But it, it's it's tough to do breaststroke. I know a lot of yeah. I know breaststrokers at my old swimming club. They spent a lot of time perfecting that kick, perfecting that stroke. They would go away by themselves and really spend time on it while we were plowing up and down the pool in aerobic sets (laughs) it it was really interesting to see just how much time goes into this craft yeah yeah and also when you look at a 200 meter race you got eight guys in the pool with eight different strokes so yeah it's not even the difference in 50 100 and 200 it's even in the 200 or in the 100 it's very it's very different everyone has their own interpretation of breaststroke don't they yeah (laughs) and you need to find what's right for you and not just copy one stroke yeah okay would that be your advice to um young swimmers who are looking to pursue a career in breaststroke kind of find what works for you rather than copying let's say yeah of course you can like try out other strokes but you just need to feel your body and always play with your stroke it's nothing like that you swim same breaststroke on monday tuesday wednesday all over the year so you always need to play with your stroke and And adapt the little things nice nice okay marco well it's been amazing speaking to you if you don't mind what we do with all of our elite swimmers is we do some quick fire questions to end the interview so our listeners can get to know you just that tiny bit better does that sound like something you're up for okay okay i try (laughs) so i think the first question is fairly straightforward what's your favorite event 200 breaststroke of course yeah um who is your swimming idol kosuke kitajima oh very very good technician um what's the hardest swimming session you've ever done oh i used to do a main set always in january in training camp it's 400 am plus 100 breaststroke 10 rounds and best average Okay, what sort of times are you going off for that? Oof, I think something like 4.45 in the IM and like 1.07 in the breaststroke. Ooh. I think it was on six minutes and two minutes. Oh, lovely. So that's... it's 80, 80 minutes of suffering. Yeah, that sounds hard work. <laughs> Tell you what, we we ask all these elite swimmers what their hardest set is. There's always a 400 IM in there. 
It's a horrible yeah. event. <laughs> um, and if you were to go on a road trip, you can have celebrities, friends, family in the car, three guests. Who would they be? I, w- I think I would just take family and friends. Okay. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> okay marco well it's been wonderful speaking to you thank you for coming on to the propulsion swimming podcast and really ending this year's show with some real insight into a very technical stroke it's been wonderful speaking to you thank you very much for having me it was really fun great stuff um we look forward to your progress at the olympics we will be cheering you on and hopefully we can speak again soon yeah hopefully i will be up for it <laughs> great <laughs> stuff you. good luck for the the rest of the season Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, that rounds it up for 2020 of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. Thank you for everyone who has joined us on this year's coverage. We aren't stopping here. Next year, we already have some amazing guests lined up for the first months of 2021. So hopefully we will see you then. And please enjoy yourselves over Christmas. Stay safe and keep swimming. We cannot wait to hear all the stories about you guys getting back in the water because I know in the UK it is just kicking off again. So I will see you soon and I will catch you on the next one.